Hey, everybody, welcome. Hey, happy holiday to all of you out there. I'm Dr. Pat, and I have been so loving. Every year, uh, Benny, every year, we do this thing where the hosts get to sit in the time spot and we'll get to work with you, Benny. Yes, right? thank you. Yep. Uh, so, it's a pleasure to have them every time. Yeah. So you're not like just Benny, like a name. Well, I mean, I they get to meet the Benny. Sure. And so like Santa a, I'm telling you what a great job. <laughs> and for those of you out there, I take this time of year uh, to really regroup, to do some creative work um, or to do some things I wouldn't ordinarily have the opportunity to do. So I want to thank everybody out there. Um, one of the things that I want to say is, and of course, I want to acknowledge for those of you tuning in, we have a new producer, Kellen. And he is running the Facebook Live venue. So it's the Benny and the Kellen joining us here today. Uh, my very special <laughs> guest, though. It's amazing, by the way. Thank you, Benny. That's, that's the way to do it. Right that's there. the way to do Good it. Job. Thank you. Thank you that is so the way to do it. That's it. And, you know, I wish I had a voice like Mimi. Um, for those of you out there, look, these are some rough times. Man, I cannot, I, I got to tell you, I had to go buy Mary Jane Mack, this brain tap thing, because these are rough times. Today, my very special co-host, Nancy Landrum, is an expert. And by the way, what do I mean by expert, right? Take a look at this. This book's about boundaries. How to Stay Married and Love It, Stepping Together, which is one of my favorites. And she is somebody that has committed her life to helping people understand there is more than one way to handle the stuff that comes up in relationships. And her own life journey was about that married at 18 widowed at 23 you know two baby boys and then to look at how she has sculpted her life and 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 has committed to understanding relationships and talk to marriage and talk to step parenting and all of that turns into a fabulous coaching practice and a coaching practice that we certainly need a lot of right now because we are now being tested beyond anything that we could probably have imagined. So the question then becomes, is, it, is a happy marriage a myth? And if not, then why aren't we happy? Nancy, it's great to have you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be with you. You know, I don't, I, this is a tough one, right? This idea of a happy marriage. I mean, you go back and you look at some of the old school shows, right? Um, and Linda, by the way, loves the Hallmark Channel, right? Yeah. Every year, the Hallmark Channel. And yeah. so we watch the Hallmark Channel. Everybody on the Hallmark Channel is happy in relationships. And they have figured it out. They get some rough patches, but then they figure it out. If it looks like that, what seems to be the secret to making it work? Well, first of all, the Hallmark Channel produces movies that are fictional. <laughs> That's right. They make it look so much easier than it really is. Uh, and there are times I wish I get... Uh, tired of the Hallmark Channel movies because I want to jump in and coach the people that are doing the acting. There are certain skills, uh, communication and conflict management skills that enable you to build a happy, lasting, loving marriage. And most of us get married with the dream of being happy and the assumption that we're going to be happy but then reality hits 
And then what do you do with reality? What do you do when you have your first fight? How do you treat each other with respect when you're mad at each other? How, what, what do you do when you have a difference of opinion that is very strong uh, over an issue that's important to both of you? When my late husband Jim and I got married, we uh, had both been widowed. We had five children between us. We thought we were older, we were more mature, we could handle anything. But the very unique challenges of step family dynamics just broadsided us. Uh, the day we got home from our honeymoon, we had a little spat. And over the next few years, that evolved and grew until it was dominating. That particular issue was dominating our relationship. We were fighting almost every day. And we looked for help. I mean, we read books, we went to seminars, we saw counselors, but we were given wonderful advice, but we weren't told how to implement that advice. Like, how do you go to bed uh, without being angry with each other? How do you resolve things so that you each feel like you've been heard and respected? We were so frustrated with the good advice but without the skills or the tools to help us implement that advice, we finally found, well, before I go on, let yeah. me uh, introduce on my website, on the homepage, first thing you see is a free download. And in that download, there are, there's a list of about 40 ways of communicating that are very common in our American culture but every single one of them escalates an argument, adds to emotional distance between the two of you, creates hurt feelings and defensiveness, like using absolutes like always and never. You never remember to take out the trash. And he's going to say, well, last Christmas I took it out. You know, he's <laughs> going to remember the exception to the rule. Giving unwanted advice. We don't think of that. It's such a common thing that we do to each other that we don't think of it as being disrespectful. But when you give me advice that I haven't asked for, what you're actually saying is you're smarter than me. You can figure this out and I can't. I need your help and it's demeaning. How about blame? Blame is like the number one relationship cancel, cancer. Uh, blaming doesn't help to resolve an issue. A real, another real common one is just sidestepping the issue, changing the subject, because you don't want to talk about whatever is causing pain yeah. between the two of you, or comparing your spouse to someone else unfavorably. Wow, that's a big blow. Uh, something that came up just recently in a consultation with a client is that her husband thinks that flirting is okay. It's just fun. <laughs> but flirting, oh. yeah, right. Flirting is emotional infidelity. So yeah. Yeah. the accusatory you, uh, you did this, you did that. Sarcasm, I was great at sarcasm. It was so hard to give that one up. Uh, talking hopeless talk, like I never do anything right is a way of sidestepping an issue or bringing up old business. Uh, one couple that I was working with recently, something happened 20 years ago that he keeps bringing up in a, uh, you know, as an issue for him that is unresolved or they thought it was resolved, but he keeps bringing it up. That's not fair. It doesn't work. So we finally, the more polarized we became over our particular issue, the worse our methods of communication became. Uh, till I was yelling at Jim because I wanted to be heard. And he finally started saying, the more you yell, the less I can hear you, which was absolutely true. But I didn't know how to deliver the message in a way that was easier for Jim to hear. So he would react defensively the argument would escalate. Uh, we were both really great at blaming the other. And it was pretty hopeless, although we still yeah. hung on. We hung on to our dream of being happy. But please, somebody tell us how. Yeah. How do we yeah. communicate? 
this is the key. Can we talk about a couple of these real quick? Sure. Um, because uh, first of all, uh, tell people where the download is. This download that you've created, this is really, this is a buster boy. This is one of these relationship busters. This is one of these things that boy, if you could catch yourself, right? But here's what I want to, where do we go? Can we go to your website, nancylandrum.com? So let's get everybody over there and get the download, right? Yes. Because when I was reading, I was reading your books, right, over the weekend. So one of the things that I, let me see if I could get here to it, because uh, I was picking up and I wrote it down. And what I wrote down was, here it is. What I wrote down was uh, the you thing. It says some examples, examples of changing a you message to an I feel. If yes. there was one thing to try, it yes. would be this. You hurt me. You shouldn't have done that. And really break it down to, you know, when, when, I hear the way you talk to me, but you see, that's not it. You talk to me. So this is really a conundrum from people, but I want to ask you this question and we're going to dive deeper into this. There is this myth about marriage and we get it in commercials. You know, we get it sometimes in just bits of communication. We get it from the influence of television, like I just talked right. about. Right. Uh, and by the way, I love some of those uh, Hallmark uh, things. I just do, because there's some days I don't want people talking at me. Right. I just want to see people live their best. So there's something brilliant about them. Uh -huh. But if you pay close attention, somebody usually messes up. <laughs> yes, well, that makes the good storyline. You make it. Somebody messes up. And you watch how they correct it. But let's talk about this for a minute. This idea of disillusionment, I think it could lead to what you're talking about. How do we help people not build a resentment? Because I, I have a situation now where, you know, we, we sit down and we talk about things, but the kind of resentment showed up in really short, snippy, you know, you can't even have a conversation. Everything is short and snippy. And you've got to know that there's something underneath that. Where does that fit in? Well, first of all, someone who's being short and snippy is focused on getting their own agenda across to you. They're trying to convince you that they're right and you're wrong. They're not really listening. They're not accepting that there are two points of view here. Both points of view are valid. And the only way to reach a resolution that works for both of you is for both of you being willing to listen to the other as for the purpose of understanding their point of view. Being short and snippy is, um, is disrespectful and it's not demonstrating the uh, character quality of I'm willing to hear your point of view in order to resolve this issue in a way that that meets both of our needs. You know, Jim and I, because we didn't know how to treat each other with respect when we were in conflict, we finally got to this place. I thought I'd read the first paragraph Please. of the two book. Uh, this was a description of where our marriage ended up because we didn't have the tools. We didn't know how to speak respectfully or listen respectfully. Okay, the first paragraph says, divorce. The word shattered the space and hung in the air between us like a red fog. Even after all the conflict we'd experienced, we were both stunned to silence by the introduction of that possibility. How could our relationship have come to this? Why wasn't it enough to love each other? We'd always heard that love and commitment were all it took to have a great marriage. We did love each other. We were very committed to each other and to our marriage. What was wrong? We'd both been through so much and were so happy to find each other. 
We were in our 40s, adults. Why couldn't we resolve the conflicts that were eating away at our love and commitment like a deadly cancer? Well, the answer to that question is that we didn't have good conflict management skills. It's not just love and commitment that make a great marriage, a happy marriage. You have to have the skills to know how to address conflict when it comes up in a way that is mutually respectful and to find solutions that meet both person's needs. We did not have those skills. They weren't modeled for us in our homes of origin. Our culture certainly does not model those skills. Most of TV does not model those skills of good conflict management. But we finally found a coach that began to teach us how do you speak to each other? How do I speak to Jim when I'm angry? but I still can't maintain respect for him. Well, it's using those I messages like you were saying. I give my clients a, a, a diagram that's called an experience diagram. And at the top of the experience diagram are um, facts or things that we don't fight over because they're, both, they're obvious to both of us. <laughs> but just under facts are thoughts. Thoughts include perceptions, assumptions, beliefs. When I perceive your message as being hostile, I'm going to react hostily, defensively. If my assumption is that you don't have my best interests at heart, then I'm going to feel resentful. If, um, if I hear sarcasm or name calling coming out of your mouth, I'm going to feel disrespected and want to fight back. So in order to get to the level of, of uh, communication where we get past the assumptions and perceptions and, and beliefs, we have to go to feelings. And feelings can be shared in three words. I feel. I feel happy. I feel sad. I feel disappointed. I feel hurt. But it's, it's avoiding the you messages like you just mentioned. You really hurt me when. And I don't like it when you do this, or I wish you would change that. Those are all you messages. Or why did you do something or other? That's a you message. So to, to share your feelings, your concerns, and your dire desires are deeper levels of communication that bypass the fight area. All fights take place up in, the, in that quadrant that says thoughts, which includes our perceptions. Uh, one of the first skills I teach couples is perception checking. You know, before you assume that your perception is accurate, tell your partner, you know, what you just said sounded like you might be angry or, with me. Are you angry? And let your partner tell the, the truth so that you eliminate misperceptions and misunderstandings. I've had some couples tell me if that was the only skill they learned it would save most of their fights, prevent most of their fights. Yeah. I want to ask you about something you just said, if I could. I was taking a few notes here. Um, one of the things I think that people feel, can you help me with this too, Nancy, is um, one of the things that people feel is unloved. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you loved. And I think that that is a feeling. Yes. Or I feel unloved. And I will say that when you hear that, um, right, I feel unloved. There's something about that. I can't even explain the power of that. Right. It, and then you, and then they want to know why right yes. what do you mean you feel unloved of course right of course i love you because then that doesn't that open it up and and i feel unloved doesn't seem like enough for me nancy it's when you dot 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 i feel unloved correct but then i'm saying you again can we talk about this because deep at the core especially in relationships love relationships when the buildup is so great that there are so many of these things, right? 
it boils down to a core feeling of where the love go. The love disappears when you don't treat each other with respect. Respect in my uh, belief system that I've kind of gotten pretty yeah. um, locked into the yeah. last years from all my experience coaching as well as my personal experience. Respect is the medium that grows love. And when you're not given respect, then love is erodes. It, it slowly dissipates and goes away. One of the ways that, one of the primary things that conveys a feeling of love and respect is when I listen to you for the purpose of understanding your point of view, not to change your mind, not to present my own argument, but repeating back what you're saying in a, without any bite to the tone of my voice, but with real sincerity, when I repeat back, what you're trying to tell me with the purpose of trying to understand your point of view, that meets one of the core needs that we have as human beings. I believe one of our core emotional needs is for there to be someone in the world who hears us and gets us. Yeah. And when we're in a relationship where that kind of being heard and valued and respected is not being experienced, then the love disappears. Yeah, I want to ask you this conversation, uh, this this question, and this is something that I want to bring it to light here. Um, when one of the things, and I've talked to you about this before, that one of the things that I got to study in school was, um, first of all, under the broken promises umbrella. Yes. But under the broken promises umbrella, what we found was it wasn't always the promise you broke right? Like, I thought you were going to take me to the movies. Okay, that's like the promise. And then you didn't do it. Right. That has an impact. But it's the thing that really drives mistrust and lack of respect is how it happens. So for example, texting somebody you're breaking up. Oh, my God. Right? Right. Or having your friend tell your friend of a friend that you can't go to the movies tonight. It's well, the how. Isn't the how the kicker as well as the what? The, the situations you've just described are disrespectful ways of communicating. One of my former clients um used to speak in a really loud voice and was kind of abrasive. And one day I asked him, when did you first decide that your voice wouldn't be heard and that you were not important? And it was when his father would break his word to him. Like it, his mom and dad were separated and his dad would promise to come by and pick him up at a certain time and he wouldn't show. And to this young man, that meant that he was unimportant to his father. That is what's being communicated. You're not important enough for me to show up when I say I'm going to. And it literally uh, sculpted his personality and his way of dealing with the world for the rest of his life. Oh, my God. He's just now learning to change that as far as his marriage is concerned, because you can't speak loud, brash accusatory language <laughs> in a marriage and expect your marriage to work. Oh, I know we're going to go to break in a minute, but I want to ask you about the various forms of this, because I, first of all, I got to tell you how much I love these books that you wrote. Well, thank you. I, I, I don't know if you guys out there are, look, you're going through a rough time. I have never seen such a great way to just walk people through how and the what of what's going on and what you can do about it. And not just this book, stepping together, stepping together. You know, I, I, I'm from a step family, right? And related to that. But this book on how to stay married and love it and the book on boundaries, we're going to talk about when we come back. Because here's the thing that comes up. You ready? 
This is what we're going to talk about when we come back. I don't know why you feel like that. I haven't said anything to you in three days. What do you mean? What do you mean that you don't, you don't like the way I haven't said anything to you. So how are you feeling like anything? How are you, why are you feeling not respected? You know, I, I left you alone. I made sure that I didn't ruffle your feathers. Silence is deadly. When we come back, we're going to talk about what do you do if your partner is the pouty partner, the one that's going to handle it all, going to step away for a week, not really talk, to give you space. <laughs> and you're it. the person that doesn't want space. You want to talk. Nancy, how do we get those downloads before we go to break? Well, go to nancylandrum.com. It's L-A-N-D-R-U-M.com, Nancy Landrum. And the free downloads on the homepage. The books are available um, on a resource page or on Amazon. And we're going to talk about the silent deadly. And by the way, do you have a question for Nancy? Or is everything just going great in your love relationship, in your work relationships? If you don't think that bosses are under a bit of a pressure right now, holy cow, I could write a whole nother book on bosses in the workplace through COVID. So we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what do you do? So do you respond to silence with silence? Do we now have silence? And what if you have kids in the house and what are they observing? Silence and silence. And then what do you do about the snippy one? The one where they're not saying very much, but when they do, it's really snippy and short and borderline sarcastic and arrogant. All of those things. How do you even begin? I feel. Right, Benny? Let's take a short, Benny and I have had to learn a few things along the way to be in us. Let's take a short break. Everybody, we'll be right back. I thought you were going to play Benny. My favorites about love. Only the way Tina Turner can do it. Oh, well, there I will look for that one. What love got to do with it? Oh, yeah, I've got to love Tina Turner, but I also love Nancy Landrum. <laughs> Nancy, this is one of the most pivotal conversations in the work that you're doing. It is beyond important right now. I mean, it is so beyond important. I am hoping that you're able to help people, even when there's so much damage that has been done here during these tough times. You know, I'm hoping that that they will pick up the phone and call you and sit down with you. Because I know for me in the relationships I've had, I've had to get help from a third party because I got to tell you, I made it worse not no. having the right tools. Right? Most of us make it worse simply because we don't know any other way. If we knew how to make it better, we would have made it better. Yeah, especially when you do the whole I feel part where you don't learn not to say, well, I feel when you do that. No, that's not like the feeling. Um, how do people get the download, though? Because that download is super cool. Go to nancylandrum.com. And on the home page, right at the top of the page is the free download. I think it's called communication that distances or communication that connects. Yes. Does and your communication connect or distance? There you go. Yeah. Um, let's get back to what we were talking about earlier, because you were sharing your story and you also talked about respect. Um, it is one of the most on almost every survey that's ever done. It's one of the most at the top of the list of just about everybody's list. And yet it means different things to different people. Right. Okay. What qualities, though, if I could ask you, what are the qualities that we are to look for to put the happy marriage tools into practice? And the reason I say this is 
because this is an inside job. We have to change inside. Yes. Right. But you've got to have some qualities. You've got to really look and say, man, when I'm like this, boy, I'm not really helping out in this. Can you talk about these qualities a minute? I think the primary quality is being willing to look at your own behavior, what you are investing, what you're putting into the relationship. And if you look at this list of defective communication tools that's in that download, and you notice even just two or three of those, when they're used regularly, damages the relationship. So are you willing to change that? Are you willing to replace poor communication tools with communication tools that are more respectful. Uh, It takes some humility to look at your own behavior and be willing to assume your half of the communication dialogue, what you're putting into it. I've I've had clients whose partners were not willing to come because they the partner thought they weren't at fault. They had nothing to change. So the change that the that my client was willing to make eventually impacted the relationship in a really positive way. Uh, in my, let's see, it's in the sequel to How to Stay Married and Love It. The sequel is called How to Stay Married and Love It Even More. Yeah. I have a chapter called One, W-O-N by O-N-E. And that's the story of particularly one client who by himself saved the marriage by changing his own behavior, by being more respectful and thoughtful to his wife, and won her back into a love relationship when she was ready to bail out. She didn't want to be there anymore. Yeah. I want to talk about something in the, in one of your books, right? You see this? Um, I'm not saying this is always, but a lot of times I think if we look, there's something that has rubbed the other person sideways and chances are it has to do with the boundary, uh, about not knowing what a boundary is or knowing what the boundary is and just stepping all over it. And I wanted to talk about the importance of this because in the book, you talk about boundaries and resentments, right? And you say resentment also creates distance in the relationship. Every time I submit to being treated disrespectfully without being truthful about how I feel, a block is added to the barrier. Every time I treat my partner disrespectfully, another block is added. Every time the truth is not spoken, the wall becomes thicker. And I think this is what we're not getting. This is, a, this is cumulative. Yes, it is cumulative. Absolutely. And the way to take the boundary down is by speaking the truth respectfully, by making it clear that, well, what Jim and I did when we were changing our methods of communicating I gave him permission to hold me to the boundary of respect. Uh, If he heard sarcasm coming out of my mouth, he could very respectfully say, Nancy, please say it differently, say it more respectfully. And when I heard him doing the accusatory you, he gave me permission. So we held each other accountable to this line of respect. And the more time you spend on the respectful side of the line, the more you're going to like each other, the more you're going to like yourself, and the easier it will be to resolve conflict. But when you spend too much time on the disrespectful side of the line, nobody's going to be happy. Uh, I'm, I had to learn not only with Jim, but in other relationships that I, do, I don't tolerate disrespect. Uh, if I had a a client wanting to meet with me a few months ago, and he was so disrespectful of my time. Uh, He called several times in the evening, and I asked him not to. He was texting me. He was kind of obsessive about wanting to talk to me, and I said, I'll talk in the morning, but not tonight. 
and he just kept calling. So I blocked his number. In the morning when I called him, I said, I'm sorry, I can't work with you because I will not work with anyone who is that disrespectful to me. I had to learn that, that lesson of respect, first of all, in my marriage with Jim, but then again with my children and with uh, you know other relationships. I had to learn how to set the boundary of, I will always treat you with respect, and I expect to be treated with respect. And I'll call you on it if I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Boundaries, I think, are a very essential part of developing healthy relationships. Okay. Uh, one of the a former client would, whenever he and his wife had a fight, he would go home to his parents and basically abandon her and the children for a week or two weeks at a time. And it was, of course, all her fault. And his mom and dad let him stay home with them. They rewarded his disrespect by giving him a warm bed and good meals and letting him stay there until he was ready to go home. That's a place where tough love boundaries were needed from the parents to him and also from the wife. I, uh, the wife would say, you know, when he'd say, I'm just going to go spend some time with mom and dad, she said, fine, go. And I said, what to the wife, I said, what you're communicating is I don't need you. I don't want you. We won't miss you. And that, that isn't what he needs to hear. She was reacting from her hurt feelings. Uh, I kind of jokingly tell my clients, you know, when, when we are using poor communication skills, we're reacting or we're speaking from the two-year-old inside. The immature child in us that is hurt and just wants to fight back. And two-year-olds damage or destroy a lot of relationships by not being respectful to each other and by not telling the truth in a respectful way. Yeah. So I, I coach this wife when he, you know, when he threatened to leave home, I just say, tell him that you really love him and want to work this out and that you and the children will miss him if he decides to go. Tell the truth. You know, Nancy, I, I think that when I think about all the work you've done and your own experiences and all the people that you've helped, I can only imagine what's happening right now as we're speaking in relationships. Um, what it is that on top of everything else, right? Um, this walking on eggshells syndrome. Yes. And are you finding it's because we don't have the tools to know how to stop and, and ask if we can have a conversation about this? I mean, even that very thing, that one thing, right? To really stop, hit the pause button, we don't even know how to ask the other person to have a conversation about it. What Jim and I were so fortunate to find were the happy marriage tools. You know, happy marriage tool, there are tools that create a happy marriage or a, a healthy relationship. And there are tools that don't, that destroy, that hurt, that create distance and disconnect. But what I teach my uh, couples or people that I'm coaching are the skills that will help you create the happy, loving marriage or relationship with your kids or help your relationship at work to be more healthy, the communication to be more respectful. Uh, one young man, uh, he and his wife, when they first came to me, he was he had one foot out the door. They just came to me as a last ditch effort to see if their marriage could be saved. And four months later, they were happy with each other because they had learned and were practicing the happy marriage skills. 
Well, one of them is to listen for the purpose of understanding. And when you listen for that purpose, you repeat back what the speaker has said in a respectful tone of voice to make sure you heard accurately. Well, he's a trainer at his job and he was trying to train a new employee and the employee kept interrupting him, which of course is very disrespectful. Well, this young man went over to the whiteboard and picked up a pen and handed the pen to this the trainee and said, whoever's holding the pen speaks and the other one listens. And uh, he spoke and then he handed it to this trainee to say, okay, now it's your turn to speak. What questions do you have or what do you wanna say? So he was immediately putting into practice the skills that he'd learned in you know, our happy marriage coaching program. He put them to work at his job with great effect. Oh, so much fun, so much fun to hear that. And, and, and that's the thing I wanted to just talk to you about here in this time we have left. We often think about marriage is marriage, relationships at work, maybe we play a sport, then you got relationships there. Then it's like you have relationships that are not at work, but with clients like Benny and I, for example. Um, and we don't seem to realize sometimes that if you learn these tools, that you can use them in different places. The reason I'm bringing it up is because one of the things that science has told us is that there's this thing called spillover effect. Yes. And spillover effect means you got a rotten day at the office, right? It spills over into everything if we let it. How do we help people literally prevent that from happening? Because now we're sheltering in place. Again, a lot of people, you're working from home. Your children are schooling from home. I'm not saying everybody, but quite a bit. Um, and spillover isn't even spillover anymore because it's worse than that. It's just a big spill. But we have to practice these. When you have the happy relationship skills and you use them everywhere, at work, at home, uh, you learn how to discharge your bad day on the way home before you walk in the door so that it doesn't spill over to your family. Uh, I One of the things I wanted to say today, just yeah. on this topic, is that these relationship skills apply to everyone in every relationship. Yeah. A few years ago, I put together a, a, a trio of three books that teach the skills with examples between a boss and an employee, between a sister and a sister, between a parent and a child. So the examples in these three books are not of marriage relationships. They're of all the other relationships that we have, but using the same skills that I teach couples to create a happy marriage. So I'm, I've got, uh, I've put together a bargain you can get these three books from me for only $20, including postage, if you email me, which is nancy at nancylandrum.com. And we'll work out how you can get payment to me and I'll mail them to you. So you don't have to be married to learn these skills and practice them to improve your relationships in every other area of your life. And I think what you're touching upon is so critical that we must learn right out of the gate. And boy, I've had to learn this, you know, not only am I somebody that grew up in the, the city, right? But I'm also a Sagittarian and sometimes true to form, open mouth, insert foot, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, there are so many things that we have to learn, but what I found is one of the most important ones is to hit the invisible pause button. Yes. And I do it so often that people look at me and they see me almost like staring into space. Yes. And they think that I'm not paying attention. 
but I'm not. I, I, the thing that I, that I wanted to say, I'm not going to say. Good right? for you. <laughs> but isn't that part of, of the practice as well? Absolutely. When my, our first coach told me that I needed to hit a pause button, I said, how do I do that when the trigger and my reaction happen in an instant? I mean, I, my stuff is flying out of my mouth instantaneously that I later have to apologize for. And she said, you have to slow things down, like you're watching a movie and you turn it on slow-mo. And the only way I could do that was to clamp my mouth shut to prevent the words from coming out of my mouth. And I'd have this inner dialogue with my two-year-old inside. And I'd say, if I let you say what you're about to say, you're going to have to apologize later. Do you want to apologize? No, I don't. I hate apologizing. <laughs> That was good motivation for me. And if you say what you're about to say, it's going to create hurt that will take a long time to get past. So let me take you in the other room where you can write all your nasty thoughts in a journal, get it out of your, you know, off of your mind, and then we'll go back and have a respectful conversation with whomever triggered those feelings. But yes, it requires a pause button. There are some good rules for a good timeout. A good timeout is I need a pause. I need a timeout. I need 20 minutes to go walk around the block or <laughs> I need 10 minutes to go pound on a pillow or write in my journal. <laughs> and I'll be back then and we can continue this conversation respectfully. But right now I'm about to step over the line into disrespect and I have to stop myself from doing wow. that. Wow. Wow. I mean, a lot of times we don't think that we, a lot of times we don't give ourselves permission to do that. We think we have to have an answer for everything, right? We think we have to be right there in front of everything and know how to do it. But this idea of, you know, the happy marriage either not being happy or uh, being too happy. I mean, we have a perception, but the, the greatest challenge we have with that is we forget that we're gonna have potholes along there the way. Potholes in every relationship. Yeah. There are potholes in every life. Nobody has a perfect life. There are no Stepford neighborhoods. <laughs> um, so learning to navigate the potholes in a way that builds your relationship instead of tearing it down are the skills that I teach. I said to uh, uh, one gentleman recently who does everything he can to avoid conflict. Yeah. And I said, what? And of course, then it builds up and boils over because it's not being addressed. And I said, what if you were to change your belief? And let's Let's just install the belief that conflict is the doorway to greater emotional intimacy. Resolving conflict is the, the way to build a stronger relationship. Then you don't have to be afraid of it or avoid it. Jim was an avoider and he, he learned, you know, that if he would address conflict, then it wouldn't blow up in his face later. He, I just give him so much credit because he was willing to learn these skills. We didn't always learn them at the same rate or at the same time, but over time he learned the skills that he needed to learn to uh, strengthen that weakness or that, yeah. that belief that somehow conflict is bad. Conflict is just life. Yeah. So let's learn how to deal with it in a way that builds our relationships closer. Yeah. And boy, uh, conflict, we get at even the earliest of ages. Sure. You know, the minute that we stand up and go after that beautiful vase on mama's dining room table <laughs> and mama's like, no, you're not, right? Uh, Nancy, thank you so much for today. Again, please mention what you have uh, and, and what you've offered for people. I know you put a bundle together, but also mention about the download again. 
Um, and let's get people to your website. NancyLandrum.com. The download's on the homepage. It's free. You just type in your email address and it will come to you automatically and you can print it out. Uh, and if that intrigues you, if you learn you know, good stuff from that and you want to know more, then there are books. There is an online relationship skills course. There's my personal coaching, of course. And I today I'm offering these three books for people that are not in a marriage, but they want to learn the skills to improve other relationships as well. And I, the best stories that I hear are stories of clients who are turning around and teaching their children these skills. And the kids are watching the skills work between mom and dad. Uh, that is, talk about spillover. That's a oh. positive spillover that I just love collecting those stories. Yeah. And I want to add to this, Nancy, Nancy and I are talking about communication now as if it's for adults only. But the most successful stories that I have heard, uh, especially Nancy in your work, have been where the entire family learns them together. Children have great memory receptors and they are fascinating when they learn a skill like this how to remind the adults yes. what to do so you work with families ages children's the works yes i have a dad right now that he and his wife were recently divorced and his relationship with his teenage daughters was very poor yeah and he made appointments, several appointments to come with his teenage daughters to learn these skills. So the girls were able to respectfully tell him how they felt about him, how they felt about divorce. Wow. Rather than acting it out in snippy ways, they're actually able to speak and have a, you know, a respectful conversation with their dad. I love it. I Nancy love Landrum, I love, love, love you. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. This is the passion of my life. And boy, I'll tell you, it is much needed in the world. Hey, everybody, we've got another show coming up on TTR. We'll see you next time.